some significant health challenges um, over the last six or seven months or so. She had a series of extended absences from the Capitol over the past half year. She had a complications from a case of shingles. She had a fall that she suffered earlier this summer. She's also, at the age of 90 years old, the longest serving member of the Democratic caucus in the U.S. Senate, the oldest member of the U.S. Senate. She had health challenges. She had absences. She had calls to consider stepping down, retiring early before her term ended in January 2025. She was not going to run for re-election. She was here for votes this week. She's been a participant in Senate business this week. And we've learned from multiple sources at the age of 90, Dianne Feinstein has died. Her seat will be vacant till filled by appointment of the California governor, the Democrat Gavin Newsom. Scott, sort of recently, she has certainly been at the center of conversations about uh, just how old some of our representatives are, whether or not um, representatives should be able to keep running over and over again. But before that, I mean, she really was um, ahead of her time in, in many, many ways. And I'm just reading some of her accomplishments. Uh, first woman president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, first woman mayor of San Francisco, one, uh, one of two of the first women elected to the U.S. Senate. Senate from California. I mean, she really sort of was a, a um, broke records, if you will. A fixture here in Washington and a fixture in her home city of San Francisco, where she took over as mayor after a political assassination in that city. When she got here to the U.S. Senate during the year of the woman in 1992, she eventually took over as chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, the powerful, pivotal Senate Judiciary Committee, which confirmed Supreme Court justices. She was the first woman to hold that position, but she was also just a formative person, a fixture in that position. Mm -hmm. She was a leader and a senior member of the California congressional delegation, the largest of Congress's delegations by state. And she was a uniquely vocal advocate for Democratic priorities. She was a lion in the U.S. Senate, and her absence is being noted by both parties. And it's critical, I think, for some people to want to remember her for all those accomplishments and not for the frailty she showed over the past year, which was noticeable, mm -hmm. becoming disoriented at meetings, um, having difficulty communicating in public settings. And Senator Feinstein stuck with this job till the very end. She was working. She was voting in her last day in office. And, you know, you listed off some of her accomplishments. Um, what kind of politician was she? As you know, um, different politicians uh, work those hallways in different ways, uh, building relationships uh, within her, within the Democratic Party, but also within the Republican Party. What was her style? U.S. senators have a collegiality about them, a collegiality that really transcends generations. It's been around as long as the Senate's been around. She has a number of bipartisan bills she's authored, and she's seen through to becoming law. She was, though, a progressive force, you know, championing Democratic priorities as the senior senator from California. Senator Feinstein has a, a track record of legislation over three decades, but also she served as a mentor to so many other members of Congress, so many women who came through the ranks following her footsteps. I talked to a California congresswoman a few months ago who says she's only here because Dianne Feinstein led the way <laughs> for other women to win high office in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Congress. Now, being a female senator in 1992 was a rarer thing than it is now, and a lot of people credit Dianne Feinstein for pushing and blazing a trail. Mm -hmm. And so then what happens now? She had already said that she was not going to run again. Uh, what, what happens with her seat? What, is, what does the process look like? Inevitably, this turns very political very quickly. Mm. Um, California's governor appoints a replacement to hold the seat until the election in November 2024. There is a uniquely heated primary among Democrats trying to win the nomination in this race, including several high-ranking, high-profile members of the California U.S. House delegation. Adam Schiff was a member of that House January 6th Select Committee, previously the chair of the House Intelligence Committee. He's running for it. Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who's from Oakland, California, former chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, also running for it. Katie Porter, who's cut a higher profile in recent months and is viewed as a particularly um, progressive uh, California Democrat with a bright future. She's running for it. 
California's governor is going to appoint somebody as placeholder. If he were to appoint one of those three, it would certainly give them a big leg up in this heated primary. And Gavin Newsom, the governor, has been unequivocal. He plans to appoint a black woman to this seat. Hmm. Does he appoint Congresswoman Lee? And does it give her an unfair advantage in this primary? Does he appoint somebody else as a more temporary, true placeholder pending the primary? Lots of good questions about what happens next. Um, and it's a reality of this world. In a 51-49 narrowly mm. divided Senate, there's going to be concern about who comes in here, even though we're just getting this news about Senator Feinstein. Yeah, and that was precisely what I was going to ask you about, just to remind us about the balance of power in the Senate and some of the key challenges that, um, you know, that one vote either way, a couple of votes either way, will, will make such a difference. They're already dealing with one right now, and it has to do with the uh, keeping the government open past the weekend and, and funding the government. Senator Feinstein's absence will not impact that. Her passing will not change the, um, the political choreography of the moment of trying to keep the government open. That battle really is being fought among Republicans in the U.S. House. But um, it will be critical eventually um, for the functioning of government and the functioning of the U.S. Senate for her seat to be filled. And because it is a Democratic governor, it will be a Democratic appointee, most certainly, into her position temporarily until the election uh, in November 2024. And just underscoring, she was retiring. She had announced earlier this year she was not running for re-election, citing, among other things, her health challenges. Um, of course, there are tributes uh, coming in. Um, I'm just going to read one right now. This is from Senator uh, Tom Tillis. Senator uh, Dianne Feinstein was a trailblazer who lived an incredible life dedicated to public service. She was one of the most effective legislators in recent memory because of her willingness to work across the aisle in good faith in order to solve complex problems. It was an honor to serve with her. Uh, Susan and I extend our deepest condolences and prayers to Senator Feinstein's family and staff during this difficult time. And no doubt there will be many um, more of these um, coming in. We are waiting for a CBS News special report. And when that gets rolling, we will pivot uh, over there. But, you know, I'm sort of taking a quick look at some of the legislation. And you're right. After so many decades, uh, you know, there are, you've, she has lived through so many historic times and has had a hand in that uh, while she was was in your know, mayor of San Francisco. This is during the era of the AIDS crisis, before we even knew what it was. And she was able to sort of tackle that. She did something sort of controversial. She closed down uh, some of the bathhouses. At the time, it was controversial. But she also really helped establish guidelines for how hospitals dealt with people suffering from this illness. Fast forward to now when she's in Washington, I'm just going to list them off, creating a federal coordination of Amber Alerts, uh, the National Child Abduction Warning System, uh, passing the California Desert Protection Act, uh, reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act to protect women from domestic violence and sexual assault, um, authorizing the 2022 Respect for Marriage Act to enshrine marriage equality into federal law. Um, boy, she has seen... A lot of social change in this country and was instrumental in helping to solidify some of those changes. Take a step back and recognize the scope and size of her job. Representing all of the people of the state of California is a Herculean accomplishment. It is the size, it is the population, it is the economy of many nations across the world in itself in California. She did so for more than 30 years. She also was a particularly forceful figure here at the Capitol. She was a leader. She was somebody who others looked up to and looked to for direction. That's not an easy thing to do in a U.S. Senate chamber with 100 very big egos. Mm. Um, but also, she was so forceful a presence. She was such a prominent person. You, know, you can hear her voice echoing from those Supreme Court nomination hearings, including the most recent one, um, or the most recent um, before the election of President Biden, the Amy Coney Barrett uh, confirmation hearings, where Senator Feinstein was among the toughest questioners of uh, then um, now Justice Barrett, then Judge Barrett. But it really is a contrast, Anne-Marie with what we saw over the past year. She was clearly in a fragile state. She yeah. became disoriented, lost sometimes at some public hearing. She was moving around the Capitol with the help of staff in a wheelchair, and she was to a degree muted, which is just not the, the figure Diane Feinstein cut over all these years. No, that, that's very true. Um, 
you know, we, we are going to be sort of talking about her legacy. And I think that, you know, that is one of the, the challenges uh, because because she was at the center of this conversation, just one of other lawmakers at the center of co this conversation about just how long a representative should be able to sit in those seats if their constituents vote for them. Um, this is, unfortunately, one of the things we will remember about her is that she was 90 and still serving, but maybe should not have been. And that's a obviously a pressing question. Yeah. How long should people stay in office? It's not lost on anybody. This isn't happening in a vacuum where you have two people hovering around the age of 80 who are front uh, runners for their party's nomination for the presidential race next year. Um, one thing that strikes me, though, about this conversation is what former Speaker Nancy Pelosi said recently about this issue, wondering if people weren't questioning Dianne Feinstein's age in a way they wouldn't do so for a man. Mm. in the office. I've been covering Congress for 20 years. I've seen an awful lot of people in the U.S. Senate in particular who have been here with very fragile health, those over the age of 90, those confined to wheelchairs in it, with an inability to speak um, on some occasions. It's not, she's not the first mm -hmm. to be in that circumstance. And former Speaker Pelosi had said, maybe we should be asking these questions of everybody, not just a woman in that position. I expect here later today, if not later this morning, them to lower the flags to half staff behind me here at the U.S. Capitol. I would expect when a senator passes away, especially one with this rich a history, there to be services at the Capitol at some point. All the members of Congress are here indefinitely because of the government shutdown. Right. But I suspect they'll plan something rather elaborate in honor of Senator Feinstein in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. Um, uh, I think that was the last point that you made, not the very last point, but the point before about questioning whether, whether or not the same questions would arise for a man, I think, is, uh, all, is important to say. Um, Scott, I want you to sort of stand by for us because we're going to uh, fold in a CBS News Chief White House Correspondent Nancy Cordes. Now, Nancy, you are currently the Chief White House Correspondent, but before that, you spent a lot of time in the hallways um, of uh, Congress and I imagine interacted with uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein a lot. Um, when I ask you about kind of the type of lawmaker she was, the way she carried herself um, in the Senate, how would you describe her? Yes, I started covering Congress in 2008 when she was really at the peak of her power and effectiveness, Anne-Marie. She was really a master legislator, and the, the, breadth of, the breadth of issues that she dealt with and made significant progress on uh, is really singular when you look at uh, senators over the past 20 years and what she was able to achieve. I mean, she worked very hard on automotive fuel efficiency as a senator from California, legalizing gay marriage. She was at the forefront of that movement. Gun safety legislation. She uh, was credited by President Biden as being one of the driving forces behind the assault weapons ban uh, that was uh, signed into law in the mid-90s. Uh, she got a major cybersecurity bill passed. Uh, she was the driving force behind getting questionable interrogation practices mm -hmm. outlawed. Uh, she uh, was someone who... Uh, who went very deep on the issues that she cared about and had a very uh, significant career even before she came to Congress. She was the first woman mayor of San Francisco. She served in that role for nearly 10 years. She was recognized as one of the most effective mayors in the country. And then she came to Capitol Hill. She was the longest serving female senator ever. She was the first woman to chair the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, this is a woman whose intellect, whose drive was formidable. And I think that that's something that uh, people tend to forget because she was somewhat diminished in recent years and didn't have mm -hmm. the same kind of uh, authority that she had had not that long ago, uh, but this is someone who uh, people who have served in the Senate for a long time will be uh, you know, mourning the passage of today because she was uh, so effective and they admired her so greatly for it. Uh, President Biden, uh, not long ago when she announced that she was going to be retiring from the Senate, Anne Marie put out a statement. He said, I've served with more U.S. senators than just about anyone. I can honestly say that Dianne Feinstein is one of the very best. Mm. Um, and as you're listing off some of her legislative accomplishments and some of her legislative fights, the word that's actually coming to mind is courage. That, um, you know, some of these um, 
topics were probably not comfortable for her to bring up, to point out that, um, you know, Americans may be participating in torture, and that is wrong, um, to be critical of this country in that way. Um, I imagine, you know, there were times where she took criticism from the Republican Party, but probably from members of her own party as well. Sure. And, you know, she was really a dog with a bone. Her crusade when it came to interrogation practices lasted for six years from when they began investigating uh, the kinds of interrogation practices that had been used after 9-11 at Abu Ghraib in Iraq and Afghanistan. And she fought tooth and nail to get access to documents at the CIA, at the Pentagon. Uh, there were all kinds of restrictions that were put in place. They were not allowed to take any of those documents out of the buildings. And so she came up with a workaround to basically send staffers to sit in these small rooms day and night and pour over these documents and take their own notes and bring the notes out with them because they weren't able to actually get any any kinds of copies of these classified documents. Um, uh, certainly the powers that be were not trying to make this any easier for her, but she stuck with it uh, when it was a popular cause, when it was not a popular cause, and finally put out a report that ended up changing policy in the United States. So she was someone who, uh, who, who did not give up, even years after the assault weapons ban lapsed. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that the support did not exist on Capitol Hill to reinstate it. She continued to advocate for it. She continued to hold press conferences about it. She continued uh, to talk about things that she would like to do because she believed, even though the votes weren't there at that moment, that they might be there at some point in the future mm -hmm. and she needed to keep the issue alive. Um, I want to pivot back to, to Scott, who's still sort of standing by for us. Scott, um, as I understand, there are a number of tributes pouring in now. Yeah, and pardon me as I read some of them from my phone because they're coming in with such a velocity right now. Uh, Senator Mark Warner, fellow Democrat, fellow member of that Senate Intelligence Committee, Nancy Reference, says he's heartbroken by this passing. She leaves it behind an incredible legacy, breaking barriers for women and taking real action against gun violence, as you were referencing. Mm -hmm. Republicans, too. This is a bipartisan moment. It always is when uh, the Senate loses one of its members. Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin says she was a very gracious person to work with. His deepest condolences. The same from Senators Rick Scott and Marsha Blackburn, both Republicans. The prayers are with her family. She is a woman who was a trailblazer in politics. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, uh, it's a moment to remember Dianne Feinstein. Her absences this year, though, were scrutinized. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that she was working with frail health was a real world issue for the functioning of government. The margins have been so narrow here for several years. Mm -hmm. Democrats with a slim majority, with just a vote or two to spare on anything, had to move things around during her absences. When she wasn't here, the Senate Judiciary Committee almost ground to a halt because Republicans had even numbers with Democrats on that committee, and they paused some of the operations of that committee when she wasn't here. So her health challenges, sad to watch, challenging to watch, were also impactful on the functioning of the Democratic majority and the Senate her, itself. Um, there will have to be, in short order, a replacement for Senator Feinstein until the election in November 2024 to continue the functioning of the U.S. Senate. Um, but at this moment, this, this tragic moment, there is a bipartisan outpouring for somebody who was a lion of the U.S. Senate almost from mm. the jump as soon as she got here. Um, and just kind of getting some information about, and you pointed out that, that she had, had was around there on the Capitol, that according to Senate records, she voted at 1145 uh, at the 11.45 a.m. roll call vote yesterday, but uh, did not vote on two votes later on in the day. Um, Scott, I imagine that it must have been challenging for some of these other um, lawmakers who have worked with her for decades, and you know, e either Scott um, or Nancy can chime in on this, who had worked with her for decades, knew her sort of at the height of her ability to move legislation, to have the conversation with her about whether or not she should continue to serve. It wasn't a conversation that they were having in front of the cameras, but I know you guys know there were conversations behind the scenes. 
Yeah, and I've, I've, and I've heard those, those concerns in the past, but they were more muted in the past. There was a senator from West Virginia who was here at a very senior stage who had difficulty moving around the Capitol and communicating at the end. A senator from Mississippi at a very senior age who had severe health challenges, had difficulty even getting to the Capitol. And I'll go back to what Speaker Pelosi said earlier this year. Why are these calls so powerful when it's Senator Feinstein? Mm -hmm. There's a couple things worth keeping in mind, and Nancy saw this as well as anybody. Senator Feinstein's frail state, the way she was muted at the end, was such a contrast to how she carried herself here for so long. There are some members of the Senate who actually do cut a low profile mm -hmm. deliberately. That was not Senator Feinstein. She was a leader. She was a vocal proponent of progressive priorities legislatively. She was a force here. So it was such a noticeable contrast at the end. I wonder if Nancy agrees yeah. to see her so muted. It was noticeable, Scott. And I'd say starting around uh, 2017, 2018, I'd have to go back to my notes, I started talking to staffers, even some of her staffers who were expressing concerns that she was losing a step, that she was uh, forgetting things sometimes, that she was repeating herself sometimes. But I, I think the fact that she was such a workhorse uh, caused her to want to keep going. And sometimes it's uh, the person who is ill who is the last to, to recognize that they, um, that they are losing a step, that they are struggling. And that was the case for her. There were people who were flagging the situation to her, who were asking her gently whether she would like to um, step back from her role. And she, uh, was, she was the one who was saying, no, I, I'm fine, I want to keep going, even when it was clear that she wasn't fine. And, and ultimately, you cannot force someone from this role if they don't want to go. Uh, I think that that was compounded by the fact that um, the California governor clearly didn't want to be put in the position of anointing someone to fill in for her, uh, particularly when we are so close to uh, an election in 2024. He would much rather, uh, he would rather leave that to the voters of California than put his thumb on the scale for one of the many individuals who are clam clamoring to take her place, mm -hmm. um, because that is so powerful. That is a, a, a really powerful endorsement of one individual over all the others. Obviously, whoever is appointed to this role now will have a leg up in 2024. So he's, uh, Gavin Newsom is going to have a, a, a difficult decision ahead of him. Does he put in place a caretaker? That's something we've seen governors do before. Does he put in place someone who doesn't want to run in 2024 mm. so that the playing field remains level for yeah. the other individuals who, who have expressed their interest? Or does he feel very strongly about one particular individual and give them a leg up? And there is a wrinkle. In the past, he has said that he would appoint a black woman to that role. And uh, so that, that limits his choices as well. And, um, you know, and also creates an entirely new political dynamic here. So it'll be very interesting to watch what the governor of California now does with this major decision that he has on his hands. Yeah, indeed. Um, and just sort of remind people um, why we, what we are talking about now. Uh, we learned uh, earlier this morning that Dianne Feinstein has passed away, longest serving uh, female uh, senator in U.S. history. She's 90 years old, but had uh, maybe kind of, maybe guys from the beginning of the year um, been suffering from a number of health um, issues. Uh, she was away from Washington for quite a while, though she, you know, insisted that she had still been working and perhaps she was working remotely like a lot of people, but has really been struggling over the last uh, few months uh, health-wise. And some of what we have been talking about is um, her vast resume, the many, many accomplishments. And when you've been sitting in the Senate for that long, um, you have been a participant in uh, almost every sort of major change that has happened in this country. Um, we, we're talking same-sex marriage. We're talking, um, you know, gun legislation. Uh, and so we've got, like, a bit of a highlight here. I, I can't imagine what the highlight reel will look like for her, because I was trying to look at this list of legislative accomplishments and determine which one was the most impactful. 
And it's really hard to tell. Um, we talked about, uh, you know, calling out the CIA for torture tactics. Um, we talked about legislation having to do with um, with gun, gun legis legislation. Um, it's 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 been quite a storied career. And you know, Anne Marie, because of her own personal story, she came into Congress with sort of a unique authority on some of these issues. Uh, the reason that she became mayor of San Francisco was because of this uh, infamous assassination that uh, killed the the mayor of San Francisco and the um, civil, and the, the the gay rights leader Harvey Milk. And so she came into Congress. Uh, as something of an authority on LGBT issues. It was something that had affected her profoundly. Uh, obviously, uh, gun issues as well, because of her unique experience once again in San Francisco and what she witnessed and what she lived through. And she sort of put those personal experiences to work. She wasn't a, uh, a showboater. Uh, she didn't walk around sort of woe is me about, about what she had been through. She simply put that personal experience to work towards the policy issues that she cared about. And she was, uh, she was remarkably effective at translating that into policy, actually authoring this legislation. President Biden said that uh, a lot of times when he was uh, in the room with her, she was the only woman in the room, particularly in the mm. beginning. She was elected in the year of the woman in 1992. Uh, before that, there hadn't been very many women in Congress. And so uh, she had to sort of blaze a trail, and she put her head down and did it. And I, I wonder uh, if within the LGBTQ plus community, too, if she is definitely going to, is going to be fondly remembered and, and, and they will be grieving because when I look at the time span that she has been representing uh, members of the community. Uh, when we look at the rise of AIDS, as we talked about, while she was um, in working in San Francisco, and then all the way to present day, uh, the uh, same sex marriage and the issues associated with that, she's really been kind of a friend of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, Scott, to weigh in on that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I didn't want to. I didn't want to step on Nancy's toes yeah. there, but certainly, as, as it just her pioneering work in the city of San Francisco shouldn't be lost either. Where she stepped into a void after a political assassination in a traumatized city, and immediately led it and became a formative figure, not just in that city, but for the entire community. The Bay Area and for the entire state. It was no surprise <laughs> she succeeded in winning that Senate seat. And there's just this dueling reality of the moment where you see the U.S. Senate paying honor to their long-term colleague, to their, to their, to their um, mentor in some cases. But at the same time, there's a very real moment occurring here in her absence. There is a distinctively narrow margin in the U.S. Senate. Until her successor is in place, this may, to a degree, keep Bob Benendez around here a little bit longer. Mm. Bob Benendez, who yesterday met with his own colleagues, 30 of whom in the Senate Democratic Caucus have called for him to resign, mm. one of whom said he'd try to expel Bob Menendez, is now the margin of majority himself for Democrats in the U.S. Senate until Senator Feinstein's successor is here. There are any number of close votes a-coming to keep the government from shutting down or to reopen it after it closes. Any number of nominations to the courts, any number of procedural and legislative matters that are coming. The margin is already excruciatingly small for Senate Democrats. Diane Feinstein has passed. There's a procedure that's needed before her successor can be put in place. This placeholder who will hold the job till the next election. And Senator Bob Menendez now measures the majority for Senate Democrats. That's a really interesting point, uh, how people's fortunes can turn um, from day to day um, on, on Capitol Hill. Um, I'll ask Nancy to sort of kind of respond to that, how crucial this is when every vote is so tight now to have a member missing um, can, can be the difference between a really long protracted fight or a really, really, really long protracted fight. Exactly. And it means, for example, that the vice president will probably have to spend more time in Washington, D.C., because she might be called upon to uh, serve as a tiebreaker in the U.S. Senate 
um, more frequently than usual. And I think Scott brought up a really great point. Um, it, what, what's going to happen in the Senate now over the next few weeks could look a lot like what happened in the House with George Santos, another uh, individual who was under a legal cloud, who was being investigated, but uh, Speaker McCarthy was reluctant to call him out or push him out because uh, his his majority in the House was so narrow. So we have seen that uh, on both sides now. And the, the big question will be, uh, how quickly does California's governor, Gavin Newsom, move to fill this seat? I mean, we are facing... Uh, in 24 hours, the possibility of a government shutdown. And the Senate is going to be taking some crucial votes uh, that will potentially determine whether the lights on stay on in government or not. And so uh, this is not uh, some, some esoteric question. Uh, it may be that, that the governor is called upon to name a successor within 24 or 48 hours. I remember when uh, Senator Daniel Inouye passed away back in 2012, and, um, and that left Democrats down one at a similarly crucial time. It was December of 2012, and the, um, the, we were up against what was uh, known then as the fiscal cliff, and uh, say, facing a similar, uh, similar deadline in Congress. And so the governor of Hawaii uh, named uh, a successor who ended up flying back on Air Force One with President Obama, who was vacationing in Hawaii, uh, hitched a ride with him to get back to uh, Capitol Hill so he could be sworn in and vote. That was uh, Senator Brian Schatz, who is uh, still in the Senate today. So um, uh, governors can and sometimes must move very quickly when they are up against a major deadline like we are right now with potentially uh, hundreds of thousands of federal workers either being furloughed or having to work without pay, including mm. members of the military, if there is no swift resolution on government funding. Yeah, it's a really all a really good reminder. Uh, we want to add one more uh, person to this conversation. CBS News congressional uh, correspondent Nicole Killian is uh, joining us now. Uh, Nicole, I, I mean, the news has really just been breaking over the last uh, hour or so, less than an hour. I don't know if you've had a chance to kind of speak to any of the uh, lawmakers, senators, representatives uh, in, in the halls there, but uh, can you give me a sense of what the mood is like? Well, I think this news really just comes as a shock to many here on uh, Capitol Hill. I mean, certainly uh, the senator was an advanced age, but she was just here yesterday on the floor voting. Uh, and so this really does come as a surprise. As of now, some of the reaction has actually come from some of her Republican colleagues in the Senate, like uh, Senator Tom Tillis, uh, Senator Marco Rubio, also over in the House, Congresswoman Young Kim of California. Uh, we have not seen... Uh, uh, as of yet, for instance, a Speaker Pelosi, who was a close friend, or uh, the senator's colleague, uh, Senator Alex Padilla, a way in as of yet. Uh, obviously, this news is still uh, sinking in. Uh, we also have not received a formal statement from uh, Senator Feinstein's office, but again, have confirmed this news through multiple sources. So I think really everybody is kind of taking a step back, uh, digesting this news about the loss of such a major figure here on Capitol Hill. Um, indeed. And maybe you can also, because you were sort of there as well um, over the last, you know, several months or so. Um, what do you recall about her? Because one of, the, sadly, one of the things we will be saying when we, as we talk about her is that there was this conversation about her decline and whether or not she was still capable of representing uh, California. And there was a significant amount of time that where she was not in Washington. Well, look, the senator has been through a lot. She battled shingles earlier this year. Uh, just recently, she suffered a minor fall. Uh, so her health has been in decline. Uh, you know, after that shingles episode, when she finally did a return here to Capitol Hill, you know, she did lighten her load a bit uh, as far as her schedule. Uh, she did still take part, for instance, in Judiciary Committee uh, meetings and hearings, but uh, not 
not necessarily every single one. And she did, of course, uh, vote uh, as well uh, for multiple, um, you know, nominations and uh, pieces of legislation as they came to the floor. Uh, but uh, that being said, you know, just in talking to a lot of senators about this overall issue of age, uh, first and foremost, you know, I think many of the senators here do have a lot of respect for Senator Feinstein, both Republican and Democrat. And oftentimes when we would ask about this issue, you know, they really deferred to the senator and said that this is her decision. So, you know, at the end of the day, she did make this decision to continue to serve. And she has been a longtime public servant. Uh, so that is certainly within her right. And, you know, that is the general consensus really among a lot of the senators that we talked to. Obviously, uh, recently we saw the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, plagued by some health challenges. And we have seen other senators, even in, younger in age, who have also faced uh, various health battles. And again, uh, you know, the consensus continues to be that this is really a personal decision for a lot of these senators to make that call for themselves if they have that capability uh, to serve. You know, you can also point to other senators. For instance, Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley. He just turned 90 himself mm -hmm. earlier this month. And many senators point to him as someone who uh, continues to serve with a lot of vigor and energy here mm -hmm. in the Senate. So it really is a personal situation and decision for many of these lawmakers. Obviously, everyone's situation and circumstance is different. Uh, but, you know, many uh, senators, by and large, felt that Senator Feinstein was doing uh, what she thought was best. Um, so just to remind everyone that we are talking about um, uh, Dianne Feinstein, Senator Dianne Feinstein. We, we got the news earlier today that she had passed away. Vlad is now uh, joining me. Uh, she was uh, 90 years old. Um, and we are, we're talking about she has been representing uh, California in some way, shape or form um, for more years than not. Um, she was the first female mayor of San Francisco. Uh, she was she served for three terms there. Mm -hmm. uh, she is the longest serving U.S. senator from California, and also the became the longest serving female senator in U.S. history. And because of that, um, she has been instrumental in a range of uh, legislation um, that has been incredibly impactful, from gun legislation, um, from uh, same-sex marriage legislation, uh, uh, protecting religious rights, you name it, she's had a hand in some of this stuff. You know, you know Emory, you point out that her legislation and the focus of her career in politics has focused on, on uh, legislation directed at same-sex marriages mm -hmm. um, and specifically gun uh, legislation. Mm -hmm. And as, you know, all of you know, Seth, uh, Nicole, and, and Nancy, her career, her political career, started in the wake of the assassination of Harvey Milk, who was the city supervisor. Uh, you probably talked about that. We uh, did, but... Yeah, Harvey but Milk, who was the first gay in. man mm -hmm. elected to public office in the United States and the mayor of San Francisco, Mayor Moscone. And, and, and I, I sort of feel that that tragedy, that horrific tragedy, um, sort of fueled a lot of her passion uh, in, in the Senate. Sure, and I think that, um, you know, it's just, I was just reminded, Vlad, of uh, this uh, amazing picture that our colleague Bo Erickson took several years ago of uh, Senator Feinstein in the basement of the U.S. Capitol. She was talking to Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who's a Republican, uh, a moderate Republican. And, and, and frankly, I can't remember the issue right now, but we'll have to find the picture and put it up. And there, in full view of everyone, she had her finger in Lisa Murkowski's face and was clearly lecturing her about how she should uh, vote on some particular topic. She was tough. I mean, she was an arm twister. She was outspoken, and uh, and she didn't back down from a fight. Uh, I think part of the reason that it was so noticeable in recent years that she uh, was diminished was because she was such a, a forceful speaker and so forceful in the U.S. Senate and so pivotal a figure in the U.S. Senate. Even though, frankly, I've covered some senators over the years. I've covered a lot of uh, senators who have stuck around maybe one term longer than they should have. And it's not as noticeable because they were not, uh, you know, they weren't 
such major deal makers in the first place. They mm. weren't out there uh, forcefully making their case on the floor, in the committee room, the way that, uh, that Senator Feinstein was. They weren't um, uh, working as hard as she was to get the gavel, to be the chair of a committee, to be the ranking Democrat or ranking Republican on a committee, knowing that that gives you so much more power, so much more visibility when you're trying to get your issues uh, some attention and trying to get your legislation over the finish line. And so I think it was the fact that she um, had been such a singular figure in the U.S. Senate for so many years that it became extremely noticeable when that started to change. Um, but, you know, this is a person who uh, racked up so many firsts. First female mayor of San Francisco, uh, as you were mentioning, Vlad, first female chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, longest serving woman senator ever. Uh, and, and very close with a number of the women in the U.S. Senate and, as Nicole was pointing out, with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi as well. They would travel back and forth to San Francisco, their hometown. They spent a lot of time talking. They spent a lot of time strategizing because they cared about a lot of the same issues. And obviously they came from uh, a similar political background and a, a similar philosophy. Hmm. Uh, uh, thank you all. Uh, we are going to have a lot more on the death of Senator Dianne Feinstein. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, but her legacy in Washington and California is one that will be remembered for the ages. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of uh, statements that are being released now from uh, the lawmakers, and here's one in particular from Senator Chris Murphy. Guys, you may not have seen it as you've been on the air with us, but uh, he writes this, from 1994, when she passed the assault weapons ban as a first-term senator, until the tragedy in Newtown, Dianne Feinstein was a lonely voice fighting against gun violence. The modern anti-gun violence movement now stronger than the gun lobby would not exist, but for Diane. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Weather turns extreme. CBS News and the Weather Channel bring you virtual weather technology so advanced, so real, you'll have time to get prepared. Feel the forecast. Weather, when it matters most, on CBS Mornings. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise your children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Politics isn't a game. Why aren't you holding yourself to that standard? Politics is about policy. Was this the right way to actually get this done? I'm a voracious consumer of information, and I'm impatient. I don't like to be spun. To be moderator of Face the Nation is not an anchor, it's not an actress. You are up here to moderate a conversation. That means bringing the most powerful stakeholders to the table to become better informed. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. She is a beloved American icon and head of a media empire. But is Oprah Winfrey happy? How do you define happiness? Yeah, I call it happierness. Find out when we go person to person. 
original documentary from CBS Reports. It was genocide. A deliberate effort by the United States government to eliminate the food source that was relied upon by Native American tribes. American bison were slaughtered and Native Americans displaced. And that's how tribes were subjugated to reservations and our lands were taken. But now, through conservation efforts at Yellowstone. Buffalo provided everything that we needed. Now they need help. A herd grows. We need to step up and help them. And a culture is reborn. When the buffalo return and come back, that's when our tribe will begin to heal. Yellowstone Bison Revival, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are continuing to follow the breaking news out of Washington. California Senator Dianne Feinstein has died. She was 90 years old and served 31 years in the United States Senate, longer than any other woman in history. Though a series of health problems had bought calls for her to step down. CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist Joel Payne is here with us now, as well as Republican strategist and CBS News political analyst Leslie Sanchez. So, Joel, let me begin with you. Uh, we're seeing these statements that are being released now um, from uh, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. Talk about the impact that Senator Feinstein had uh, in passing legislation that was specific to the party's interest, but to the interest of all Americans. Yeah, Vlad, um, you know, you guys um, shared that statement from Senator Murphy before the break, and that was an appropriate uh, memorialization of her impact on that issue in particular, um, you know, fighting for um, gun safety, um, being really on the pioneering end of the um, the, the gun rights or the uh, gun safety, gun control fight in the country um, from a very different time. She was an icon um, and she was a giant. And, you know, um, I worked for Harry Reid, uh, the late former Senate Majority Leader, and I said this when he passed, but you don't have many of, of these folks anymore. The, the way that our politics work, these kind of singular figures, these people who have been around forever and who are kind of embedded into the embroidery of the, the city and into the kind of political establishment, that's Dianne Feinstein. Um, I also think just her her own kind of political, um, how people think about her politically. She is from Sa um, San Francisco, from California, former mayor with this, you know, amazing um, kind of native story from the the murder of Harvey Milk, the assassination of Harvey Milk and Mayor Moscone, uh, to where she kind of transcended as a trailblazing national figure. That's a very kind of progressive legacy. She also kind of trended very centrist and, and really kind of learned, I think, to represent all of her constituents um, in, in California and uh, really to the consternation of a lot of national Democrats at times in recent years. Um, Nancy mentioned her time on the Senate Intelligence Committee. But I guess if I could capture it, I would just say a really comprehensive legacy, a really significant singular legacy, and uh, uh, someone whose uh, contributions will not soon be forgotten. And of course, you know, the tributes are coming in from both sides of the aisle. I'll read a couple from uh, some Republicans. Uh, Senator Tom Tillis read this a little bit earlier, but Senator Dianne Feinstein was a trailblazer who lived an incredible life dedicated to public service. She was one of the most effective legislators in recent memory because of her willingness to work across the aisle in good faith in order to solve complex problems. Senator Marco Rubio from Florida, Senator Feinstein was a political pioneer with a historic career of public service, intelligent, hardworking, and always treated everyone with courtesy and respect. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you, Leslie, your thoughts on how you believe she'll be remembered. I love the, the, the homage there of courtesy and respect, a lioness. We talked about the late Senator Ted Kennedy as being a lion of the, of the Senate. Um, she was a lioness. She was someone who could bring people together. And when we talk about true, the, the true bipartisan spirit, um, it, it was a, a bigger leader who understood the purpose of, the, of their service. And you can never deny that. And I think one of the other important uh, points about her, her long career is she was one of the, of the first pioneers that were changing the presence of the Senate. She was that feminine uh, kind of uh, trailblazer who turned a state. She was coming from a state, if you remember that, for her first, her special election and her election in 1994 that had traditionally been red. It is taken for granted now that California is a solidly blue state. 
But her victory in 1994, uh, was really a big start in California moving into this blue wave. She was the emblematic of the type of leadership and the bipartisan spirit that that state needed. And I think it's a legacy both sides of the aisle can continue to learn from. Jill, let's talk about the impact that this will have in the Senate as her role is now left vacant. Obviously, the governor of California, uh, Gavin Newsom, I believe, if that's the way it works across both all 50 states, the governor will be able to appoint somebody. But there is that period where, uh, as Seth MacFarlane pointed out to Anne-Marie earlier this morning, where now uh, Robert Menendez, who may have been thinking about resigning, as so many of his colleagues have called for him to resign, becomes a consequential figure in the Senate. Yeah, it's a good point. And, um, you know, unfortunately, we do have to turn to the, uh, the matters of the day. Um, and it's a very consequential matter. Look, she is one of um, a very slim majority for Democrats in the Senate. And I think that, um, you know, her passing um, creates um, real peril um, in the event that something happens with Bob Menendez in the intervening days. I, I think Scott's point is right. I think it makes it less likely um, that Democrats will be, um, you know, kind of urgent to, to move on Menendez for their concerns about the charges, the federal bribery charges that he was brought up on last week. Um, that's really the state of all of our politics. Look at Kevin McCarthy in the in the House. You've had uh, some recent um, resignations and some you know folks like George Santos in trouble. He can't afford to have those seats vacated. Um, I'd say in the Senate, Democrats are in a very similar position. Um, I do think just really quickly on, on Governor Newsom, um, what really complicates this is there's a very active, very competitive primary in California for Senator Feinstein's seat, which he was not going to contest in 2024. You have uh, among the kind of leading candidates, uh, my former boss, um, Representative Barbara Lee from um, the Oakland, California area. You've got Katie Porter and Adam Schiff two very notable California representatives who have been really slugging it out in a really competitive primary. And I think that complicates Governor Newsom's choice in this moment. Governor Newsom has talked about the desire to appoint a woman of color to that position, Barbara Lee being a woman of color. Other very notable women of color in California would be viable for that position. That's a, that's a tough um, choice for Governor Newsom in this moment. Um, I want to sort of pivot back to some of her accomplishments, Leslie, and I was kind of z zeroing in on, um, you know, there were accomplishments for women and accomplishments for the LGBTQ community. Accomplishments for women, we're talking about the uh, domestic violence legislation that she was able to get passed. And, you know, you think it would be a no-brainer to have legislation that protects women against domestic violence, but there was pushback. Right. You know, it, it wasn't sort of universally uh, approved, though she did win over a number of Republicans as well. She she continued in every reauthorization to go on the floor and say, sorry, I'm sorry, I have to keep repeating this, but would cite the latest statistics on women that are being, you know, put in these brutal situations mm -hmm. and how we had to come together on something like this. She was re uh, just relentless uh, in her efforts to protect women and be that voice. And what I talked about earlier about having female leadership in the Senate, these were the types of measures that they really took uh, as, as personal agenda items to convince and, and, and use their political prowess to, to make America better and protect everyone, whether it was LGBTQ or, or women, underserved communities, whatever that may be. She did the assault rifle ban. She was always concerned about that. And I think to her strength, she was able to reach across the aisle and find that compromise. She wasn't that polarized figure you see today. Uh, she was looking for ways they could meet in the middle. And that was really a mark of her leadership. Mm -hmm. And you know, just I'm sort of quickly looking at uh, some of the statistics associated with the Violence Against uh, Women Act and whether or not it was impactful. And uh, certainly when you look at the National Archives, they say, you know, fewer people are experiencing domestic violence, decrease, decrease of 35 percent since the passing of that bill. Mm. So, you know, it's not just because part of the argument was this is unnecessary. Right. There are already laws in place to, right. pr to protect people from this sort of violence. And she said, no, we need to carve out a special protection for women. Well, Anne-Marie, if I could say that point, that was the point of her going on the floor consistently and talking about that. She was raising that awareness because it's it's in the silence and in the darkness mm -hmm. uh, that that domestic violence continues. So being that that person who could really champion the issue was, uh, I think, the reason there was so much attention given to it 
both inside the Senate chamber and externally across the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Joel, as you know, uh, Senator Feinstein was instrumental in passing uh, the 90s era assault uh, uh, gun ban. Um, and in 2013, she reintroduced legislation uh, to, uh, for, for that assault ban uh, uh, and showed that a majority of Americans supported that. Um, we've, we've been talking about this because I sort of feel that that will be her lasting legacy. The one that you, what you mentioned, Anne Marie, uh, about violence against women, uh, her, her passion over same-sex marriage um, and the right for people to be able to marry uh, who are same-sex, and, and her stance on, on weapons in the United States. Yeah, Vlad, I mean, th I think the, the point that belies what you're saying here is that there is a really fulsome legacy here. Um, Leslie so, I think, wisely and, and uh, comprehensively talked about the work on the Violence Against Women's Act. You bring up the the uh, the gun control, the, the, the assault weapons ban. Obviously, her work as the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee um, during kind of the post-Bush Iraq war era. That was significant. Um, there's so much there, which I think um, for a lot of folks, that's why it was so frustrating in her later years, when I think her legacy became so convoluted because of her health and because of the frustration with, you know, that that seat somewhat feeling in peril because of her constant health struggles. I think it's easy to miss the forest for the trees. And you shouldn't with this woman, with this pioneer, because she really accomplished a lot. And I think it's hard to capture it, frankly, just on one set of issues. It's it's so comprehensive and the breadth is so in, in, impressive. Yeah, that's one of the things we were talking about earlier today, because when you look at the legislation that she's been instrumental in getting passed, it just it really just runs the gamut. Right. And I'm going to go take it back to even before she was in the Senate as mayor of San Francisco, becoming mayor during the rise of AIDS, which we didn't at the time yeah, know sure. was AIDS. Right. Uh, we didn't know how it was spread. We knew that the there was this um, disease that seemed to be, you know, afflicting gay men. Mm. And she was really instrumental in figuring out how what needs to be done to contain, mm. to treat. She was responsible for the first AIDS Awareness Week ever in 1984. Like, it, it, it's a different time now. But, but back 1984, then, it was you know, a huge, there was a huge, lot of discrimination. Yes. There was a lot of blaming, um, you know, blaming lifestyle choices for getting this disease. And so it was courageous to sort of speak out at that time. I, I would also just say, too, really quickly, obviously, we've talked around, um, you know, how she ascended to kind of local office in San Francisco. She was already on the Board of Supervisors, I believe the president of the Board of Supervisors. Mm -hmm when the mayor, George Mosson, and when Harvey Milk um, were assassinated um, in, in um, you know, kind of a, a really um, just um, terrible incident in, in the city hall there in San Francisco. But the fact that um, she kind of entered national politics with that credibility as being somebody who was on the right side on those issues, on the right side on the LGBT um, uh, Q issues, and 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 obviously was very aware and very ahead of the curve on issues like HIV AIDS awareness. Um, she entered the national stage with that credibility um, because of the fights that she fought locally in San Francisco and what she brought into the national consciousness. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you know, uh, there was a question that we were sort of debating about uh, if her passing will perhaps lead to a coming together of uh, both parties over issues as we face possible government shutdown. And I just thought to myself, I mean, John McCain was known as somebody who was willing to re reach across the aisle. Yeah. Even his members of his own party tended to support his legislation. Uh, but now the modern Republican Party has moved away, very far away from the, uh, and it was just only a few years ago that Senator McCain passed away. So there are these crucial votes coming up uh, in the Senate, Leslie. Uh, the government shutdown is looming. Um, any Could this be the catalyst that brings both sides together to uh, pass this budget or probably not? I would like to say it was, Vlad. I mean, I think a lot of us would like to agree that. I think there would be a moment of coming together and appreciating and honor this remarkable legislator. But when it comes to the politics of that, that's really the interesting question 
her legacy and her time and, and, and kind of grooming and growing and leading within the Democratic Party, you could still argue it's not the same Democratic Party she came into in 1992. We're talking about on, in the Senate on a national stage in 1994. California looks very different. The progressive left uh, looks very different. Um, and it, it's just not the same type of philosophy uh, in terms of working across the aisle. And I would say that's on both sides, right? There's, it's so highly politicized on the right and the left. But I, I think there's a lot of us that are nostalgic. I would go to, to Joel on that for that kind of leadership, right, mm -hmm. for, for people coming together. Um, and, and those were the lions and, and lionesses of the Senate that we just don't see a lot of today. Can I just add really quickly, I know we probably have to go in a second, but just talking about her role in the Senate, the Senate raised me, okay? That's where I started my career in the United States Senate. And she is such, such from a bygone era that kind of like transcended party. Mm. Um, um, you knew Don vigorously on those issues, but oh, shucks, I uh, hope you guys can hear me, but she fought vigorously on those issues, but she was also somebody who had credibility across the aisle. And coming from an era where that was um, rewarded and that was something that was worth uh, pursuing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's different now, particularly in the United States Senate. That body is fundamentally different. And I think she also represents a bit of a passing of the torch from that era as well. Yeah, you know, you would think that with um, both houses being so, so close in terms of numbers that this was, it would encourage cooperation. But what we see increasingly is the exact opposite and, and things not getting done. Um, we just received a statement um, from Diane uh, Feinstein's office. I'll just read this uh, to you all. Um, sadly, Senator Feinstein passed away last night at her home in Washington, D.C. Her passing is a great loss for so many from those who loved and cared uh, for her to the people of California and she that she dedicated her life to serving. Senator Feinstein never backed away from a fight for what was just and right. At the same time, she was always willing to work with anyone, even those she disagreed with. If it meant battering, or rather, if it meant bettering the lives of Californians or the betterment of our nation, uh, there are few women who can be called senator, chairman, mayor, wife, mom, and grandmother. Diane Feinstein was a force of nature who made an incredible impact on our country and her home state. Uh, she left a legacy that is undeniable and extraordinary. There is much to say about who she was and what she did, but for now, we're going to, be, to grieve the passing of our beloved boss, mentor, and friend. And if you're just tuning in, uh, you can see right there on uh, the screen, Senator Dianne Feinstein um, has passed away. She was 90 years old. Uh, she had suffered from a number of uh, medical issues um, over the past maybe six or seven uh, uh, months or so. She had, uh, you know, she was sort of visibly slowing down. Uh, she was in a wheelchair and she said that she was not going to be run going to be running again. Um, I, you know, I haven't seen any sort of recent polls, how they felt about her in California, but I know that, uh, you know, she was incredibly popular in California over the decades that she represented that state. Well, she and, and Leslie, you, you may have a thought here as well, Leslie, but I'll just say really quickly, she survived a primary challenge her last election. Um, and California, because of the jungle primary nature of what they do, I think that allowed her in part to survive that. But um, I think she was going to have a challenge if she decided to, to go for the seat again in 2024, mm -hmm. um, which is why there's such a competitive primary now. That said, I think there will be an outpouring of affection and of love for Senator Feinstein in the in the California um, and, and throughout California. She is a beloved and respected figure. Um, you know, Joel, I mentioned uh, that she had had some health challenges. And of course, you know, one of the things that we have been talking about when we, even before this, were, were, when we had conversations about her legacy, we talked about whether or not the last bit of her time uh, as senator was going to taint her legacy because she was clearly weaker. Um, there, were, there were conversations about whether or not she should 
stay in office. She seemed uh, like she still had the fight in her and that she, you know, it appeared as if for a while there, Joel, that she was going to run again. Um, many of her fellow senators, uh, maybe they weren't saying things in front of the cameras, but you would know what the conversations were like, you know, in the hallways and in the offices about whether or not she could still serve at the level that the people of California deserve. Yeah, for sure. And I'll, and I'll, I'll be brief. I'll, I'll stop yapping so we can hear from my friend Leslie. But, um, but I'll just say really quickly, um, yes, look, her, her age and her ability to do the job. I think also when we're talking about age, there's two different things. There's age and then there is the capacity to do the job. Bernie Sanders is an advanced age, but no one has questions about his ability to do the job. And I think sometimes those issues get conflated. Mm -hmm. But um, I think given her health challenges, there were some real earnest concerns about her ability um, to, to do the job and to serve vigorously. And there's also a really burgeoning generation of new political figures in California who have been looking for an opportunity to rise. And I think Senator Feinstein's seat pr provides that opportunity. All right. Um Joel and Leslie, thank you so much for jumping in there. Initially, we thought we were going to be talking about, um, you know, funding Shut the down. government, and what's happening over the weekend <laughs> and all that sort inquiry. of stuff. Yeah, but, uh, you know, things change. Um, and so we really appreciate you guys jumping in. Thank you. Thank you. All right. As Anne-Marie said, we're going to take a quick break, but we will, of course, have much more on the death of Senator Dianne Feinstein, her legacy in Washington and in California. Stick around. We'll be right back. Weather turns extreme. CBS News and the Weather Channel bring you virtual weather technology so advanced, so real, you'll have time to get prepared. Feel the forecast. Weather, when it matters most, on CBS Mornings. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise your children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land this power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Politics isn't a game. Why aren't you holding yourself to that standard? Politics is about policy. Was this the right way to actually get this done? I'm a voracious consumer of information, and I'm impatient. I don't like to be spun. To be moderator of Face the Nation is not an anchor, it's not an actress. You are up here to moderate a conversation. That means bringing the most powerful stakeholders to the table to become better informed. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. She is a beloved American icon and head of a media empire. But is Oprah Winfrey happy? How do you define happiness? Yeah, I call it happy -erness. Find out when we go person to person. An original documentary from CBS Reports. It was genocide. A deliberate effort by the United States government to eliminate the food source that was relied upon by Native American tribes. American bison were slaughtered and Native Americans displaced. And that's uh, how tribes were subjugated to reservations and our lands were taken. But now, through conservation efforts at Yellowstone. Buffalo provided everything that we needed. Now they need help. A herd grows. We need to step up and help them. And a culture is reborn. When the buffalo return and come back, that's when our tribe will begin to heal. Yellowstone Bison Revival, now streaming on the free CBS News app. 
I'm a very curious person. I wake up every morning asking, what's happening in the world? Why is this happening? And how do we answer that question? You can't get answers in a tweet on Face the Nation. We try to separate the noise from the news. You need to be able to have an actual conversation. It is 10 a.m. in Washington, where many are mourning the death of California Senator Dianne Feinstein. The 90-year-old was the longest-serving woman in the Senate. Feinstein was, the, was first elected in 1992 and is known for her work on gun safety and women's rights issues. In a statement, James Sauls, chief of staff to the senator, said Senator Feinstein never backed away from a fight for what was just and right. At the same time, she was always willing to work with anyone, even those she disagreed with. CBS News' scholar Henry has more on her life and legacy. Dianne Feinstein served in the U.S. Senate longer than any woman in American history. Along the way, the California Democrat took up wide-ranging causes, including LGBTQ rights, the environment, and gun laws. We have to come to grips in America with our love affair with weapons. Joe Biden, who was Senate Judiciary Chairman at the time, Credited Feinstein's leadership in sponsoring the 1994 federal assault weapons ban. She went out and did something that was a product of an incredible amount of work. In the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, Feinstein spearheaded a six-year review of the CIA's controversial detention and interrogation program. If you were ordered by the president to restart the CIA's use of enhanced interrogation techniques, that fall outside of the Army Field Manual. Would you comply? The San Francisco native was first elected to the city's Board of Supervisors in 1969 and ran unsuccessfully for mayor twice. Feinstein became the city's acting mayor under tragic circumstances after the 1978 assassination of Mayor George Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk. Following a failed run for California governor, she won a special election for a Senate seat in 1992. Five additional terms followed. In 2018, Feinstein came under criticism during hearings on the Supreme Court nomination of Brett Kavanaugh. It was revealed the senator initially had not disclosed a letter she received detailing sexual allegations against Kavanaugh. I did what I believe was right. Feinstein later embraced President Biden's nomination of Ketanji Brown Jackson, who became the first African-American female Supreme Court justice. I am very proud to support her nomination. At age 89, Feinstein announced she would retire at the end of her term in 2024. She's a legend. She was able to convince people on both sides of the aisle to go along with her on issue after issue after issue. As she announced her plans, Feinstein tweeted, quote, even with a divided Congress, we can still pass bills that will improve lives. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Washington. So we want to bring in CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian to talk a little bit more about uh, Senator Feinstein. Uh, Nicole, you've been working uh, that Congress, the hallways there for a while now. How are members of Congress reacting to the senator's passing? Well, this is really coming as unexpected news, I think, to a lot of senators. Uh, Nicole, and it looks like Majority even... Leader Chuck Schumer is about to address this on the Senate floor. Let's take a listen. Madam President. Majority Leader. Madam President, first woman president pro tem of the United States Senate. Earlier this morning, we lost a giant in the Senate. 
Senator Dianne Feinstein was one of the most amazing people who ever graced the Senate, who ever graced the country. She had so many amazing, wonderful qualities wrapped up in one incredible human being. She was smart. She was strong. She was brave. She was compassionate. But maybe the trait that stood out most of all was her amazing integrity. Her integrity was a diamond. Her integrity shone like a beacon across the Senate and across the country for all to see and hopefully emulate. Dianne Feinstein would typically say when you asked her how was she voting on something, let me study this issue before taking a position. Let me go home and read on it. And when she came back, if she believed the cause or the vote was right and vital to many issues she cared about, she not only voted for it, there was no stopping her in getting it done. She would take on any force any special interest, any opponent with, root, re, with relentless integrity and would wear those opponents down until she succeeded. Again, her integrity just shone through them and she won and she won and she won and each time made the country a better place. I saw this up close when she passed the assault weapons ban a passion of hers after what happened to her in California. The NRA was a relentless, often mean-spirited and chauvinistic foe. They oozed vitriol against her. But they didn't scare her. They didn't stop her. And they failed against her. Like most of her opponents, they failed against her. Her perseverance, her strength, and most of all, her integrity shone through. I was privileged to carry the bill in the House after she had passed it in the Senate. She guided me every step of the way, and her strength and her integrity strengthened all of us who were fighting that uphill fight. And, and as we went through that bill, it became clear to me, Diane Feinstein is not like the others. She's in a class of her own. Of course, it wasn't just the assault weapons ban she fought for. Her accomplishments also included championing the Violence Against Women Act, protecting oversight authority during the investigation into U.S. torture, fighting for climate justice, fighting for marriage equality, fighting for reproductive justice. The list goes on and on. As chair of the Intelligence Committee, Diane fought for what was right, even if it was hard and difficult and took months and years to dig in and find out what actually went wrong. She never stopped. She took on the CIA and asserted Congress's oversight authority during the investigation into United States use of torture. And through all of her accomplishments, this one and all the others, she always displayed the quintessential grace and strength. None of these sons of guns against her ever rattled her. I remember a few years back when a particularly nasty senator tried to put Senator Feinstein down in a, in a condescending, many would say chauvinistic way. She reacted not defensively, but with strength and poise and integrity. And within three minutes, she put this colleague in her place in his place. And by the end of it, everyone in the room on both sides of the aisle was smiling. That was Diane to a, to a T. Powerful, prepared, unflappable. She had to be. Whenever she did something, she was often the first to do it. She was elected as the first woman president to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, the first woman to serve as mayor of San Francisco, the first woman to serve as U.S. Senator for California, the first woman to chair both the Senate Rules and Intelligence Committees, the first woman member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, 
And the list goes on and on and on and on. Our nation will be forever thankful to Senator Feinstein for the accomplishments she fought for. I too am personally indebted to Diane, not just as a colleague, which of course I am in so many ways as a colleague, but as a friend and as a father of two daughters. Diane's work extended far beyond the United States Senate floor as she gave a voice, a platform, and a leader to women throughout the country for decades. Diane didn't just put, push down doors that were closed for women. She held them open for generations of women after her to follow her. She gave a voice, a platform, a model for women across the country who aspire to roles in leadership, in public service, who want to leave their own mark on the world, who want to make this country a better place for others. Today, there are 25 women serving in this chamber, and every one of them would admit they stand on Diane's shoulders. So Diane's impact extended far beyond the Senate floor and far beyond politics itself. So today, we grieve We look at that desk, and we know what we have lost. But we also give thanks. Thanks to someone so rarefied, so brave, so graceful a presence served in this chamber for so, that someone like that served in this chamber for so many years. In closing, let me just say this. The sign of a leader is someone who dedicates the whole of their spirit for a cause greater than themselves. The sign of a hero is someone who fights for others, who endures for others, no matter the cost, no matter the odds. And the sign of a friend is someone who stands by your side to fight the good fight on the good days and on the bad. Diane Feinstein was all of this and more, a friend, a hero for so many, a leader who changed the nation, sorry, a leader who changed the nature of the Senate and who changed the fabric of the nation, America, for the better. As the nation mourns this tremendous loss, we're comforted in knowing how many mountains Diane moved, how many lives she impacted, how many glass ceilings she shattered along the way. America, America is a better place because of Senator Dianne Feinstein. Today I join with my colleagues in mourning our beloved friend and colleague. Yield the floor. Mr. President. The Republican leader. You know how we all refer to each other as my friend from whatever state it is. Honestly, frequently that's not true. Um, but Elaine and I were actual friends of Dick and Diane. Elaine served on a corporate board with Dick for a number of years. When they were in town together, we would frequently have dinner together. Elaine and I got married shortly after the 92 election. And I remember that Diane gave us a small depiction of the Capitol. I looked at it this morning because it's still on the wall and uh, remembered our dear colleague as a truly remarkable individual. As the <clears throat> majority leader has pointed out, she was an incredibly effective person at every line, at every level, and she was at all of those levels on the way to the Senate. Those of us who were fortunate to call Diane our colleague can say we served alongside the longest serving female senator in American history. Diane was a trailblazer in her beloved home state of California and our entire nation are better for her dogged advocacy and diligent service. 
Over the past three decades, the senior senator from California was also the steady hand leading sensitive and consequential work as head of the Intelligence Committee and the Judiciary Committee. Her name became synonymous with advocacy for women and with issues from water infrastructure to counter drug efforts. Of course, the first woman <clears throat> to lead her hometown's board of supervisors and then govern as mayor was making history and making a difference long before she came to the Senate. And as much as this institution and the American people will remember Diane's devoted public service, as I indicated earlier, Elaine and I will also remember and cherish a friendship of 30 years we were fortunate to share with Diane and Dick. So today, I know the entire Senate family is gathering around Senator Feinstein's loyal staff. Our thoughts and prayers are with Diane's daughter, Catherine, her granddaughter, Eileen, the entire Feinstein, Feinstein family, and with all who mourn our dear colleague and friend. to the Senator, uh, Senate Pro Tem President, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Diane's daughter, Catherine, with Speaker Pelosi in the gallery. Mr. President. The President Pro Tem. Mr. President, yesterday, the senior senator from California. Um, so we've just been listening to Senators uh, uh, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell um, speak about their relationship with uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, who, in case you're just tuning in, passed away. Uh, we learned about the news this morning. She was 90 years old. She had been uh, battling some health challenges over the last uh, seven, six, seven months or so. Um, but she apparently was in the Congress early yesterday and had participated in at least um, one vote. Um, Nicole Killian's been standing by uh, for us. Nicole, you know, I, we've listened to a lot of speeches on the Senate floor, and, you know, Vlad can kind of uh, attest to this. I, and, they, and senators have talked about a lot of emotional things. I don't remember hearing senators, both of them, really trying to keep their composure. This was clearly an emotional thing for them to do. Well, absolutely. And I would say it's probably not the first time we've seen some emotion from these senators. But I think if you think about how long many of them have been serving together with Senator Feinstein, I mean, we're talking decades, uh, particularly when you're talking about uh, Leader Chuck Schumer and Minority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell, who you heard there say, you know, he was friends with Senator Feinstein and uh, her husband, her late husband. And so, you know, I know we talk a lot about partisanship here on Capitol Hill, but I think it can't be understated that there are real friendships and real relationships between a lot of these members, and certainly many of them kind of want to get back to that era of collegiality, uh, but they certainly try, and, you know, Senator Feinstein really did have the respect of her colleagues, both on the left and the right, even if there were policy differences, and so I think that is why you heard a lot of emotion there, uh, particularly on the part of both leaders. And I would also point uh, the next speaker uh, that was on the floor was Senator Patty Murray, who came in at the same time as Senator Feinstein, the year of the woman in 1992. And you heard Leader Schumer there reference the fact that there are now 25 win women in the Senate, all of whom stand on Senator Feinstein's uh, shoulders. So a uh, really kind of powerful moment there on the Senate floor. And a lot to take in, too, with that black bunting and draping uh, over the senator's desk. So uh, let's talk about what we expect to see in uh, the days uh, and perhaps even weeks ahead as the Senate pays tribute to Senator Feinstein. And I'm, I'm guessing, I don't think we've heard yet from the president of the United States. Uh, I know that uh, Joe Biden, obviously, having spent many, many years alongside Dianne yeah. Feinstein in the United States Senate, uh, will have uh, a statement of some sort, and perhaps we might see some kind of tribute to her legacy, Nicole. 
Yeah, and I would also note we did get a statement a short time ago from Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi, uh, which is very important to note because she was very close friends uh, with Senator Feinstein. And in fact, her daughter, one of her daughters, uh, was assisting Senator Feinstein in her return to Capitol Hill. Uh, but uh, Speaker Pelosi called Senator Feinstein a champion uh, for the Golden State. She described her as pioneering, really outlining her entire legacy as mayor of San Francisco all the way uh, to her trajectory here in the U.S. As Senate. So uh, really, this does leave a very big hole in the state of California, uh, particularly as we prepare for an upcoming election. We know that Senator Feinstein had announced her retirement. She was preparing to step down. But this also now uh, raises questions of what happened to this seat. Uh, which is has been a source of discussion and debate as there is currently a Senate primary underway. But also, you know, the governor will likely have to appoint someone uh, to this seat. And there has been a lot of calls to make that person a woman of color, uh, considering that after uh, then-Senator Kamala Harris was elevated to vice president. Uh, there are no black women in the Senate because of that. So there have been a lot of calls to name a black woman to this seat. Of course, there is one running in the Senate primary, Congresswoman uh, Barbara Lee. But just a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, Governor Gavin Newsom seemed to indicate uh, that he may put someone else potentially in that seat that he doesn't want to put his finger on the scale, if you will, in that Senate primary. So it's possible he could name uh, someone else, although there are a number of people advocating uh, for Congresswoman uh, Barbara Lee. So uh, we also don't know what the timing could be on naming a replacement. You know, this comes at a very precarious time for the U.S. Senate. You know, we are on the verge of a government shutdown, funding due to run out. Over the weekend, the Senate is set to move forward on a package, but now they are down a vote, and it's not just Senator Feinstein. We know of at least two other uh, Democratic senators who are out for other health reasons. And so, you know, this really is a numbers game as far as government funding is concerned. So, you know, will somebody be named right away? Will it take a few weeks? Uh, we just don't know uh, the answers to that yet. Um, all right, Nicole, we actually do have a statement um, from the president. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll just read some uh, points. But Senator Dianne Feinstein was a pioneering American, a true trailblazer, and for Jill and me, a cherished friend. In San Francisco, she showed enormous poise and courage in the wake of tragedy. Just going down a little bit further, I knew what she was made of, and I wanted her on my team. There's no better example of her skillful legislating and sheer force of will than when she turned passion into purpose and led the fight to ban assault weapons. Uh, Diane made her mark on everything from national security to the environment to protecting civil liberties. She made history in so many ways, and our country will benefit from her legacy for generations. There's much more to that statement, but I think that component right there gives you a sense of how the president feels about her. Indeed. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, Nicole, thank you very much. Uh, you've been a uh, trooper uh, with us as uh, we remark and uh, look back on the legacy of Senator Dianne Feinstein. Uh, thank you very, very much. I'm sure we'll be speaking with you uh, throughout the course of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a quick break. Uh, we'll have much more on the death of Senator Feinstein and her legacy. Stay with us. Weather turns extreme. CBS News and the Weather Channel bring you virtual weather technology so advanced, so real, you'll have time to get prepared. Feel the forecast. Weather, when it matters most on CBS Mornings.
an original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful. To keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To so land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Politics isn't a game. Why aren't you holding yourself to that standard? Politics is about policy. Was this the right way to actually get this done? I'm a voracious consumer of information, and I'm impatient. I don't like to be spun. To be moderator of Face the Nation is not an anchor, it's not an actress. You are up here to moderate a conversation. That means bringing the most powerful stakeholders to the table to become better informed. America Decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. She is a beloved American icon and head of a media empire. But is Oprah Winfrey happy? How do you define happiness? Yeah, I call it happierness. Find out when we go person to person. An original documentary from CBS Reports. It was genocide. A deliberate effort by the United States government to eliminate the food source that was relied upon by Native American tribes. American bison were slaughtered and Native Americans displaced. And that's uh, how tribes were subjugated to reservations and our lands were taken. But now, through conservation efforts at Yellowstone. Buffalo provided everything that we needed. Now they need help. A herd grows. We need to step up and help them. And a culture is reborn. When the buffalo return and come back, that's when our tribe will begin to heal. Yellowstone Bison Revival, now streaming on the free CBS News app. If you're just joining us now here at CBS News, we are looking back on the life and the legacy of Senator Dianne Feinstein, who has just passed away. Uh, She passed away late last night. We got the news early this morning. uh, And of course, we've been talking about her and her legacy all morning long. Let's go to CBS News political director Finn Gomez, who is in Washington, D.C., with more on this. Uh, So, Finn, um, let's talk about There's a lot to get done in Congress. Uh, I know that, as we saw from uh, Senator Chuck Schumer and Senator Mitch McConnell, that many are overwhelmed uh, with the news of uh, Senator Feinstein's passing, but there is work to be done. What's the process for filling Senator Feinstein's seat? How does that work? Yeah, it's really largely up to Governor Newsom, the governor of California, who has indicated that uh, if he did choose, if uh, Senator Feinstein had vacated the seat that he would uh, appoint, uh, select a, a woman of color, a color, a black woman to fill that role. Um, there, we have been hearing a name, uh, at CBS has been hearing a name that uh, there have been uh, potentially several candidates, but Shirley Weber, the uh, well-respected uh, California Secretary of State, is one that has been mentioned. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the, the, he has avoided and he said he's not going to pick any of the three uh, Democrats, three Democrat, Democratic Congress uh, lawmakers who um, are currently running in the Senate primary, very uh, mm-hmm. bitterly contested center, uh, Senate primary, and that's uh, uh, Congressman Adam Schiff, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, and, and Congresswoman Katie Porter all are vying for that seat. Uh, uh, Senator Feinstein had already indicated that she was not going to uh, run for re-election. Uh, so um, there was some criticism from Barbara Lee towards Newsom when he said that he was not going to appoint her. 
Uh, Newsom felt that that would give an advantage to those three Democrats if he had selected one of them uh, to fill that vacancy. Uh, but um, yeah, there, he is under pressure to move quickly uh, to fill that seat because, as you indicated, Vlad, there is, you know, there's a potential looming shutdown, and every single Senate uh, vote is needed by the Democrats, uh, and uh, and so it's it'll be interesting to see what he does in the next uh, few days, uh, perhaps earlier to appoint someone. I think another interesting note, Vlad and Anne Marie, is that he also appointed the last, uh, um, the last uh, senator, uh, uh, Senator Padilla, after Vice President Harris. Uh, left that her seat to, of course, be vice president. Uh, so he will have this uh, distinction of actually um, uh, naming the last, you know, the, the two uh, California senators. So does that mean that he'll likely be putting somebody in who's essentially just a placeholder um, so that he, he doesn't have, you know, uh, anyone sort of getting an advantage if they are actually competing for this job, if they're going to run for this job? Uh, typically, uh, when you're sort of choosing a, a placeholder senator, for lack of a better phrase, where do you draw that person from? Uh, yeah, and you've had about, you know, there's about a, a little over a year left in Senator Feinstein's, uh, Feinstein's term. Uh, so uh, um, the con uh, excuse me, the governor had said uh, that he would only appoint this person as an interim replacement, and then who, and then of course leave it for the election. Uh, to um, to uh, to see who would be the the next senator, and I think because that Senate seat is is a, a strong Democratic seat, it would likely be um, mm -hmm. uh, good chances that it would be one of those three that are running for in that primary. So I think, but the process is that uh, he would appoint. Uh, it would be an interim. Uh, it would be only for an interim basis. And then, and then, and then, eventually, it would he would let the you know obviously he would let the people of, of California decide, the voters of California decide, uh, for that uh, for that election for the seat. All right, uh, Finn Finn Gomez, thank you so much. Thank you. All. So we want to take you to Capitol Hill, where moments ago House Speaker Kevin McCarthy addressed reporters on the death of Senator Dianne Feinstein. Let's listen. Moments ago, the flags over the Capitol were lowered in memory of Senator Dianne Feinstein. As California's longest serving senator, Senator Feinstein broke barriers and blazed a trail for women. Her career was, by any standards, historic. Speaking personally, I worked with the senator for quite some time, together on many different bills, but the one that I think stands out was our water legislation. It was historic. It was the first time in California history in more than 25 years that we were able to pass water. It was the WIN Act, and I remember the hours and the nights that we would have to work to try to work through and the challenges. We come from different parties, we have different philosophies, but we put our state first. At the same time, Barbara Boxer opposed it. It was one of the last votes of the Senate, it had more than 70 votes at the time. And I believe at the end of the day, the trailblazing of the first woman elected mayor even coming from a different party, inspired women from both sides of the aisle to seek elected office and to have their voices heard. My deepest condolences to her family, her colleagues, and to her staff. Last night, the House did something none of you sitting here thought we can do. The number of questions I could take in the number of weeks about doing appropriation bills. I told you, don't give up on us because we're not giving up on the American people. We passed three appropriation bills, defense, state, and foreign ops, and homeland security. My biggest question is I don't understand why the Democrats voted against funding the government. In all, we have four appropriation bills done. There's 12 overall to get done. It's the discretionary spending every year that government is supposed to do. We have now in the House passed more than 70% of the discretionary spending on appropriations. Need I remind you, how much has the Senate passed? Zero. Not one appropriation bill has passed the Senate. <clears throat> We've done what many have said was impossible. When I became Speaker, I said we're going to change Washington. And we did that by keeping our commitment 
to restoring regular order. Bills that passed committee in June and July have been open for amendments for months. Struggled with a number of members who wouldn't allow it to come up, but I never gave up. 440 amendments were considered on the floor this week. And for those who are historians, we are the first Republican majority to pass the state and foreign ops bill through regular order since 2006. My entire political career as a member of Congress, the Republicans have never been able to do what they just did last night. As we continue to get conservative wins and return to regular order, we actually need a stopgap measure to allow the House to continue to finish its work to make sure our military gets paid, to make sure our border agents get paid as we finish the job that we're supposed to do. Another reason for the stopgap is to address President Biden's historic failure on the southern border. This is how bad things have gotten under President Biden's watch. In five days, there's been more than 50,000 illegal border crossings. Put that in perspective, in just five days. That's more than twice as much as the average for the entire month in the last administration. A wide open policy hurts America. We've heard it from Democrat leaders across the country. But despite the chaos, the president still won't go to the border. Setting new records every day, fentanyl, at an all-time high killing Americans, and he refuses to go to the border. He's been one time he's in 50 years. All right, we're continuing to uh, look years. back on the life and legacy of Senator Dianne Feinstein, uh, but as you just heard from uh, the House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, there is a business to be done in the halls of Congress. Let's go to CBS News Chief White House Correspondent. Nancy Cordes. Um, Nancy, uh, before we get to uh, Kevin McCarthy, uh, let's talk about uh, what the President of the United States is saying, has said about Dianne Feinstein and her legacy. Well, he put out a statement a short time ago, Vlad, about his former Senate colleague. And uh, I think what stood out from that statement uh, about a woman that he worked so closely with, particularly on the assault weapons ban in the mid-90s, but so many other issues as well, he said, I knew what she was made of, and I wanted her on our team. He was talking about why he recruited her to serve on the Judiciary Committee when he was the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and notable uh, that after she was recruited onto that team, it was just a couple of years after she became a senator that she was authoring and pushing through this major piece of legislation, the assault weapons ban, and it really, um, you know, established her as a formidable legislator and a leader, and she would go on to lead uh, on so many other issues from fuel efficiency to uh, gay marriage to cybersecurity to interrogation practices. Um, and he also went on to talk about uh, the current business happening uh, on the house, uh, in the uh, House, which is trying to hammer out some sort of funding for the government so that we are not looking at a government shutdown. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, pretty proud of himself, saying that the House has so far passed four appropriation uh, bills, uh, three of them just last night, but there are 12 in total to pass. So I'm not sure how it works. If they pass four of them, does that mean that those departments will then are guaranteed to be funded beyond this weekend, but they still got to hash out things for the other departments? Only if those bills were then to be passed by the Senate. Mm. And it doesn't look like they're going to be. In fact, I can assure you that they're not going to be. The Senate is controlled by Democrats who, like the president, uh, don't support the bills that the Republicans have been putting forward. In fact, just a short time ago, the Office of Management and Budget announced that President Biden would veto those spending bills if they were to get to his desk. Uh, and, and they said that that is because those bills are a blatant violation of the funding agreement that the speaker and the president hashed out just a few months ago. Uh, they say that the cuts in those spending bills are reckless, that they don't fully fund the FAA, for instance, that they uh, uh, leave uh, uh, food assistance for women and children underfunded, uh, and that the 
homeland security bill that Republicans have put forward, a border security bill, uh, is not in line with American values. And so, yes, uh, McCarthy is right that Republicans have managed to pass some, uh, some spending bills on the floor, but it doesn't count if uh, those bills are sure to be defeated or ignored in the U.S. Senate 24 hours before a shutdown is set to kick in. Nancy, let me ask you, uh, we heard House Speaker uh, Kevin McCarthy uh, suggesting that uh, the president hasn't done enough on the southern border, uh, but uh, and I, I, my memory is fuzzy on this. I know that members of the military, if the government goes into a shutdown, won't get paid. What happens to Border Patrol agents uh, if there is a shutdown? Uh, it's a it's a complicated mechanism. There are some workers, if they're deemed non-essential, that can get furloughed. There are some workers, if they are essential, who have to continue to work without pay. I believe that Border Patrol agents would fall into that bucket. But uh, that doesn't mean that uh, border security operations are going to go un unaffected, because there are all kinds of people who work behind the scenes, who are administrative, who make, you know, uh, make the, the Border Patrol operate who um, are, you know, sort of doing uh, all kinds of work on the back end that will cease. And so it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter if you've got people out there on the front lines arresting, for example, people coming across the border illegally, if then all the people who process them mm. and who house them and who deal with the paperwork and who uh, enter them into the, the judicial system, if, all, if a lot of those people are furloughed, you can see how very quickly you have a mess on your hands. And that's something that's going to get replicated in every uh, agency within the federal government if we go into a shutdown mode. Hmm. All right, Nancy Cordes for us at the White House. Nancy, as always, we thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. After a quick break, we will have much more on the death of Senator Dianne Feinstein and her legacy in Washington and in California. Stay with us. Why did you want to share your story? Water up this high? Where are these coming from? That's the million dollar question. I'm a very curious person. I wake up every morning asking what's happening in the world? Why is this happening? And how do we answer that question on the CBS Evening News? An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Haitians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We aim every night to be factual and fair. That's our goal. An original documentary from CBS reports. Controversial Congressman George Santos. Why won't you answer our questions? How did he manage to get elected? Thank you very much. God bless you and God bless the USA. George Santos' campaign was a campaign of deceit, lies, fabrication. And who is he, really? I knew him as Anthony DeVolder from Queens. Really, who he is, he's a fraud. I compare him to the Tinder swindler. From people who know him, the truth, the facts, the lies. He would say that he was worth $100 million. It's an incredibly cynical episode in American politics, beyond satire. Had you ever seen anything like this? No, and I hope I never see it again. Campaign of Deceit, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Since childhood, she never stopped reaching for the skies. Now she spent more time in space than any other American. I like being a part of something bigger than me. Peggy Whitson's extraordinary career as a history-making astronaut when we go person to person. Feel the forecast on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I think I ask direct questions. I don't know that they're tough questions per se. Why aren't you holding yourself to that standard? It doesn't look like Congress is doing anything. What has to happen? That's the role of Face the Nation, to focus on the issues at hand. That means a civil conversation with perspective.
about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming Cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Republicans on the House Oversight Committee have subpoenaed the banking records of President, uh, President Biden's son and his brother, Hunter and James Biden. The subpoenas request all documents for communications in the bank's possession from the beginning of 2014 to now. Numerous business and associates of Hunter, Eric Sherwin, have also been subpoenaed. The requests come after yesterday's hearing in the GOP-led impeachment inquiry of President Biden. And CBS News senior investigative correspondent Catherine Herridge joins the stream in our noon hour with more analysis on the investigation and subpoenas. In New York, an appeals court rejected former President Donald Trump's effort to delay Monday's start of his civil fraud trial. New York's attorney general filed a $250 million lawsuit accusing Trump, his family and his businesses of inflating the value of their properties to obtain favorable loan terms and tax benefits. Earlier this week, a judge ruled Trump committed fraud for years and 